Uh, this is my first screen. And awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I never know if like uh, electric te technology is being nice to me or not. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so I have in front of me um, the screen of uh, people to the right uh, and uh, and then my uh, what should be the secret pocket by Peggy Janicki. So, um, and I got the thumbs up, so we'll get started. So it's uh, 10 o'clock. Um, I want to um, do um, my uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, I wish to acknowledge that the land on which we, that I am uh, uh, zooming out from is uh, the ancestral unceded and shared sacred territory of the Katsi, Kwatlin, Samiamu peoples, and am committed to seeing their land safely returned to them or compensated for. Um, what I've what I like to do for land acknowledgements is when I was first doing them, they were quite, um, uh, what do you say, uh, like reading off of an index card. And what I'm learning now uh, and what I like to do is I feel land acknowledgements are a bit of a conversation or at least a story. So I uh, put this picture here uh, to begin uh, to center my uh, story of land acknowledgements. And so this is a a picture uh, from a hike that my family and I did, and it is from the top of Mount Tom, which is out, uh, the, Fra out the Fraser Valley. Uh, and once you get there, it's about an hour and a half. Well, it's an hour and 45 for me. Uh, we get to the top, and this is the, one of the views. And I had posted this picture to, um, to uh, social media. And I had a sister who was living in Winnipeg at the time. And she was like, Peggy, where is where is everything? And I quickly uh, put the black lettering. Uh, so there's Cultus Lake, there's Vetter Mountain, uh, Chilliwack Mountain, Dudney Peak. Uh, I put that on the picture and then I reposted it. And um, soon after, um, and I'm also friends um, with Dr. Uh, Sonny McKelsey uh, on social media. And he quickly, like within the hour, he was like, hey, Peggy, what are the Halcom Alum place names of these, of these places? And I had to say, like, really quickly back, I actually don't know uh, these particular uh, land, uh, land um, place names. And so I had to go research them. And I just want to share, like, I know Mount Chiam, uh, Mount Chiam is Hlithlake, and um, it's I've I've changed that in my brain. Like I don't um, when I look at that mountain, I'm always like, well, that's not Mount Chiam. That's to me, I'm like, oh, that's Hlithlake. And so when I um, uh, when I look at this picture, it's like, okay, I know the work that I need to do on trying to uh, replace the English words with the Halkamalem uh, place names. So Cultus Snake, Cultus Lake is Swilcha, for example. So I just want to offer that out as um, uh, my, my conversation around land acknowledgements. Uh, I want to introduce myself. Um, I'm Peggy Janicki. I go by she, her. Uh, I am Da Kalsne Tamasu from Nak Asli Waten, and Jeff Point of Skokale First Nation calls me daughter. I'm a fisher person, teacher, author, union leader, Salish weaver in training, graphic facilitator, mom, wife, grandmother, auntie, sister, daughter, and friend. So I just offer a, a picture. This is a picture of me. Um, out on the Fraser River up in Lillooet. And so my family, uh, my husband's family, uh, we are fishing for sockeye out of the Fraser River. Uh, so I spend uh, my summers uh, standing on the edge of a cliff and fishing uh, with a dip net. Uh, this sadly is heartbreaking. There was no sockeye uh, this last summer. So a uh, little bit <clears throat> Excuse me, a little bit sad news. <clears throat> Sorry, I have water. I want to uh, thank the workers. 
So my hands are raised to um, all of the workers of BCTLA, um, of this building, of uh, Surrey School District. Um, it was really wonderful. I When I pulled into um, the school, there's somebody outside helping you with parking. Um, I got my presenter envelope and there's like, I had, excuse me, a handwritten uh, thank you card and um, everything set up. And of course, like even just now, like three people are checking on me to make sure I have everything. So I just want to raise my hands in uh, gratitude for all of the workers who just magically, you know, appear coffee and, and treats out, out in the hallway and magically make Zoom meetings. So <laughs> I just wanna raise my hands to all of the people behind the scenes. Um, the next one is, I want to thank each and every one of you here. Um, I, as a grandmother, am realizing that we, um, uh, life is very busy. Life is so busy. And I just want to appreciate uh, all of your time uh, because you have put all of your other work aside so that we can be here together. So I just am really appreciative um, of, of our time here together. I will be trying to um, keep an eye. I'm just going to look over and make sure uh, it's 10.06. I'm just going to try and keep an I'll be looking over to make sure I'm keeping an eye on our time together. Um, uh, so thank you to everyone here. I uh, would also um, start, I would like to begin talking about uh, my content warning or what I call the emotional health and safety um, is um, we will be covering uh, topics of Indian residential school, uh, colonial harms, murdered missing indigenous women, uh, 60 scoop or millennium scoop, uh, any of those topics, I just want to um, let folks know um, that that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, and just to say, um, you know, folks, uh, the norms, so I have uh, sharing norms and context. So I, uh, on the slide is engaging with Indian residential school histories and legacies. Example, 60 Scoop, Millennium Scoop, Murdered, Missing Indigenous Women and Girls can lead to emotional reactions and unexpectedly difficult thoughts and feelings. Sometimes these can resurface or surface hours, days, or weeks later. Um, this is perfectly normal. Um, if you find yourself overwhelmed, uh, it's important that you respect your needs and to be kind to yourself. Um, I was sharing with the group, so I've already presented this um, in person here this morning. And um, I was just saying, I was, uh, during COVID, I had put my name forward to be on the BCTF executive uh, and served um, the majority of my time um, in, in that time. And I think the longest Zoom meeting I was in was 12 hours. And so soon after, I was going to the... Um, to the chiropractor. And one of the stretches the chiropractor taught me was you take your thumbs and you turn them way behind you far as far as you can. And what that does is it kind of stretches this part out because uh, what I find is uh, when I'm hearing really difficult things and I, I notice that my body freezes. And if I can just remember to move my body or stretch um, is to sort of um, kind of to get out of that freeze mode. Uh, and I am inviting you to do the same or uh, however you want to look after yourself um, when we're covering these topics. Uh, today is going to be our time together, sorry, is going to be about stories. So it's gonna be stories as medicine, stories about stories, story themes, uh, stories as sacred responsibilities, stories for ethical purposes, and that stories are not apolitical. Um, I wanted to talk about stories about stories. So um, I am a newly published author uh, for the book, The Secret Pocket. And um, I just wanted to tell the story uh, of when the story came out. And my brother and I were visiting my mom in uh, the hospital. She was actually at the Abbotsford Rehabilitation Hospital. 
and uh, she had um, uh, was convalescing there. So after she was had her operation, she was in this in this hospital to um, to heal up. And so we went to go there to visit her, and uh, the worker came into the room and was grabbing the serving tray, like the food tray to take it away. And my mom was like, grab that napkin. <laughs> and I was like, okay, mom, I'll grab that napkin. So I, I grabbed the napkin, like not really knowing, but as soon as I touched it, I knew, um, oh, this is a, like, this is a really good napkin. Cause it's the ones that feel like fabric. And like, as soon as you touch them, I was like, oh, okay, this is really good. And so I gave it to my mom and then I looked over and I said, you know, said something to my brother. And then I looked back and the napkin had disappeared. Um, and I was like, mom, where did the napkin go? And my brother, like without uh, missing a beat, he was like, oh, that's mom and her LeJack ways. And I was like, oh, well, what's that about? And um, that's when the story came out. Uh, so the two parts, uh, the one part is talking about how the girls uh, sewed secret pockets inside their petticoats uh, to hide the food that they stole. So um, they had um, um, had done this. And uh, the other part was in, in there's a part of the story where one of her classmates was holding a, a tablespoon of peanut butter in her hand all day long. And so she would see this girl like every once in a while, like, um, like touch her hand and then just quickly touch her mouth every once in a while. Uh, and she found out later that day that was um, the young girl was had stolen a tablespoon of peanut butter. So that's when the story um how the story had come out. Um, I had actually, um, I thought it was important to talk about when I wrote the story, I wrote it from my point of view, uh, which is, um, you know, uh, Peggy and Jim go to the hospital to visit their mom. And um, when I had given that version to the publisher, the publisher actually rejected it. So, um, it wasn't a text. It was like in the picture here, but it was definitely the phone call. You do get the phone call of "Hi, sorry, um, we don't we don't want this story." And so I just remember being very sad, of course, uh, trying to like think really hard about, um, uh, you know, well, how you know what is it that you had actually wanted? And so the publisher had said, well, we wanted the book from your mother's point of view. And I was like, oh, well, this is quite different because, you know, I had gotten her permission to tell this story uh, when I teach about Indian residential schools. Um, and uh, University of Fraser Valley actually picked it up as their graduation initiative. And so I got my mom's permission for that as well. So like along the journey, I would go to my mom and ask permission. Uh, but sadly, at this point, my mom has passed away. So I was uh, really struggling to figure out how do I, how do I get that permission? And so uh, during, again, this is all during the beginnings of COVID. And I was talking to my cousin who was then chief of our community. So this is Nak Asli Waten uh, up at Stewart Lake, um, Fort St. James. And he was chief at the time. And I was like, how am I going to, um, like, can you name like an organization um, that, you know, maybe I could give back to? And he had listed a few, I think maybe three, but the one that caught my attention was the Nakasley Elder Society. And the Nakasley Elder Society, <clears throat> excuse me, is, um, I already know their work. They do amazing work within our community. And one of my favorites is they, um, <clears throat> in the late spring, uh, they set up tables out in the parking lot of our, of our community graveyard. And they have uh, what's called like a spring clean. And families come and they um, come look after like our families, our the generations before us and you know they're weeding or looking after their families but what I love is those kinds of days are um, you start talking about family lineage like family you know, you know oh this is your auntie this was so and so and so all of these obligations and stories come out during that 
um, what I think is on on those spring clean days. So I had um, I approached, I phoned uh, the elders, and <clears throat> and it was a little bit awkward uh, because I didn't know that person personally, but of course she knows my entire family. This is the community where everyone is my cousin, everybody's my other, my auntie or my uncle or my grandmother or or you know, extended uh, grandmother, so I guess grand aunties. Um, and so everybody's related, um, you know, our, our uh, nibblings and everybody. So um, when I asked, you know, I was like, hi, this is who I am. And she was like, oh yeah, I know who you are. I know your family. And I was like, okay, well, I was just gonna ask if um, you would consider being on my author contract. Uh, because, you know, I'm being asked to write a book about Lajac Indian Residential School. And she was like, she was over exuberant because I was, and, and it's always really tough talking to elders, I find, because often is, um, you're, you're not supposed to be like, you're not supposed to like tell them what to do. <laughs> and you can't, Anyway, so it's, it's kind of an awkward um, conversation for me because I was like, hey, you know, just so you know, like I haven't written the story and I haven't, um, it hasn't been accepted. And, you know, there's, there's still a long process to happen. But as soon as she was, she said yes. Um, as soon as she said yes, when I hung up from that phone, I knew that I could write that story. And so I wrote the story, uh, The Secret Pocket, probably in two hours uh, over the winter break. And um, uh, and it was key that it was going back to the elders. And so 90% of my author contract actually goes back to um, goes back to the elders uh, society in Fort St. James. And that was, uh, so what I put in my blurb before this particular session is the, um, from Dr. Daniel, uh, Dr. Daniel Heath, he wrote an amazing book called Indigenous Literature Matters. And in it, he's asking that question, how, um, how are we to be good relatives? And this was my answer to that, was trying to figure out, well, how can I be a good relative with this story? And so uh, this process of um, talking to the elders, having the elders as part of the contract um, was really important for me to, um, to, to, um, to be in part of answering that, um, answering that call or answering that question. And it's a tough question, right? Like, how are you being a good ancestor when you're telling these stories? Um, I'm also like to talk about is the story <clears throat> and along with the lesson that I've been teaching for over 20 years is I really am um, adamant about when you're telling these stories is that they're strength-based so that you're telling the beauty and the strength and the wonderfulness of our families before you um <clears throat> Sorry, before you talk about all of the um, the genocide and the awfulness um, that has happened to us in the last um, few hundred years. So it's it's important to me. Uh, so in the book, I do talk about um, this really beautiful place of, uh, I guess, food sovereignty. Um, there's a scene where they're in their food smokehouse and um, they're cuddling. And it's just a really beautiful, cozy moment. So it's strength-based, 90% goes to elders. Just moving to the next slide here. Um, I was really fortunate to be invited along with many others to go to Dr. Nicola Campbell's doctorate um, dissertation, what's that called, defense. Um, and, and so I'm a big fan of hers and I love uh, quoting her wherever I can. Um, and so this is from her dissertation, uh, quote, stories of sacred responsibility. So to witness, remember, and recount is a sacred responsibility within the practice of imparting Indigenous stories, because stories are alive and the voices and knowledge of our ancestors is embodied within them. 
Um, this quote uh, really spoke to me because like I had said, my mom has since uh, passed away. So where is that story? Like, what is what are my responsibilities to that story um, and, to, and to my community? Just moving on, uh, stories is sacred um, responsibility. Uh, this is the, um, the information I had put in, um, in the description of our session. So I put it here just to make sure that I stay on track. So this is um, story, storytelling according to Dr. Daniel Heath Justice asks in part, how do we become good ancestors? How do we become good relatives? Um, and I feel that I was, I'm able to stay on track this way. So um, I feel like we're on the right track. Uh, reframing our stories of genocide to include agency, decolonization, uh, resiliency, uh, and resiliency to align with uh, strengthen Indigenous community and wellness. I'm going to talk about um, stories for ethical purposes. Um, again, this is quoting Dr. Um, Nicola Campbell, the stories and insights encountered through this research have effectively challenged me to push with greater endurance towards an embodied ethical purpose, to learn and employ deeply intellectual and courageous acts of decolonization through creative and critical practice, and to challenge others to do the same. Now, um, to me, uh, decolonization and uh, what I had mentioned to the group before, is there's a few definitions of decolonization. Um, I quite love, of course, Dr. Linda Smith, uh, decolonization, um, indigenous, sorry, indigenous research? No, she's very famous. I can see the front of the cover, I apologize. Uh, but it is Dr. Linda Smith. Um, and uh, there's, a, I had read a really wonderful article something to the effect of the big history project. And it was a scholar who was analyzing uh, the huge, huge history project. That's an online resource about history. Um, and she analyzed like thousands of resources. Um, and sort of what she was saying in the article was that this, um, that decolonization for them was about revealing resistances. And this is really important is to understand that our communities, our families have been for decades and decades, have been, um, have been resisting. We have been saying these things. Uh, so when the, uh, the to Kent Loops to Shaquemek uh, press release came out, uh, it was all over the news, of course. Uh, and just recently the Stalo Nation uh, had their press release, and again, out in the news, along with many other First Nations, are doing research, are um, looking to their properties, um, and uh, doing this work, and then doing a press release. Um, and lots of people were very upset, as they should be. Um, but the thing uh, I found was that's something that we've been saying all along. We've, we have these stories of resistances. We have these stories of counter narratives all along. So somewhere along the line, uh, we're being silenced. We're being um, uh, like it's been, a, you know, a bit of a cover up. And so I um, feel that in the definition of decolonization is to reveal those resistances. So as such, I just, um, to the last group, I said, well, have you heard of um, a beautiful woman? Her name is Dr. Rose Charlie. And, um, and often many people don't, but I invite folks to Google her, to look her up. Um, and she is a First Nations woman out of Chehalis First Nation. So a Stala woman, uh, there is, uh, she has done a biography uh, she, I believe, the last time I looked, I think Knowledge Network has picked up, <clears throat> along with other stories, um, I think it's the Untold Stories series, uh, but if you look, <clears throat> look her up, she, um, she has been a, a pivotal political figure in BC for First Nations, and what happened was in the mid-60s, well, even in the 50s, there was... Um, 
uh, the women of our communities could uh, sign up and have what's called um, either the Indian Homemaker Society or Indian Homemakers Association. Sorry, I've forgotten the title exactly. But the women were coming together and they were having like sewing nights or they were having um, or even Salish weaving nights or uh, quilting nights. And so they were coming together, but those group of women became very political, very fast, because they were talking about the inadequate housing, they're talking about the inadequate services for their for their children, not enough food, not enough jobs, like all of these very political things. And so uh, Dr. Rose Charlie actually began BC, the BC Assembly of First Nations. And it was really, and I know about her because she was a friend of my mom's. And uh, when I attended her funeral, uh, it was really wonderful to see, um, sorry, I've forgotten his name. Um, he's the grand chief of the BCAFN right now. Uh, and he had come to the funeral and it was really wonderful to hear him say, he was like, we are so indebted to Dr. Rose Charlie, to her and to her family, because she began the BCAFN she began all of this movement uh, and, she, and he was like, and if we didn't have her telling us what to do, we wouldn't have known what to do. And so if folks don't know this name, like why, why, why do you not know this name? And so I just kind of offer that out as sort of just as a question sort of out there. And um, as, as sort of that, you know, it's decolonization is about revealing resistances. Sorry, I'm moving on. I have to, I have to stay with the stay with my slides, or it's um, not going to go very well. Um, now, uh, uh, the next quote is from Dr. Sean Carlton. Uh, is uh, really uh, quite really interesting to me. So I'll read it first. In heeding the calls of the TRC or the Truth Reconciliation Commission and Indigenous writers such as Manuel and Miracle, I believe that we all have much to gain from continuing to put truth before reconciliation and learning to work toward justice, decolonization, and our future liberation. Uh, and I underlined, I emphasized truth because um, folks may or may not know um, uh, Dr. Sean Carlton is a non-Indigenous author, but he, along with a First Nations scholar, Dr. Um, St. Clair, they're coming together and what's happening is uh, there's a group of people, um, as of April 1st, uh, launched a website that are denying that Indian residential school ever happened. They are um, uh, full out denialism. Sorry, I just see a chat box right now. Oh, wonderful, thank you, yeah, yeah, there it is. Thank you, somebody put it in the chat. I'm gonna say Dora K to everyone. So uh, BC Untold Stories, awesome. Um, uh, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Sean Carlton, so when folks, um, when you uh, when you publish, you actually have an opportunity to reach out to people to do a review for your book. And so I was quite uh, intent, quite intentional with uh, reaching out to Dr. Sean Carlton. Um, and he has done a review of my book, um, but he's also done other articles around this denialism. And so he's quite, uh, he's written articles, he's written, um, he's, he's quite into social media in different platforms to, to continue this conversation and to put truth out there to make sure that the denialism uh, doesn't, um, you know, that we're displacing those um, those voices that are denying that Indian residential school happened. Uh, and they often are, um, they're often an overlap of, of these folks that are also anti-SOGI uh, one, two, three folks. Um, I'm just gonna put my union hat on for just a moment. Um, and and um, I know I was in, 
a school board meeting and um, some of these folks came in uh, and they were very anti-Soji. Um, and there was a part, um, my principal was presenting their report and right after the report, um, the folks, um, the anti-Soji folks went into this rant of, of, of awfulness. And so um, it's been my experience. There's a bit of overlap or there's uh, can be an overlap of anti-Soji and uh, Indian residential school denialism. I did find my mother's number. This is it here, 0289. My slide, oh dear slide. Um, I'm just moving into uh, stories are not apolitical. So uh, within my school district, uh, and I've been using this uh, particular website often, and I promote it. It is uh, Dr. Debbie Reese's blog. Um, I quite love this website for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that it's searchable. So I circled here on the top left-hand corner of her website uh, uh, that you can search it. I think that window, the searchable box does not show up uh, if you're on your phone and maybe on an iPad or a smaller device. So just so you know, um, when you go to this website that it's, um, that if you're on a larger, if you're on a, a laptop or if you're on a desktop, that it, it'll show the, the searchable box. Um, the, uh, um, this particular blog um, has been super helpful for me. I use it often. Uh, she's, uh, this is an indigenous scholar. She is quite voracious, um, a writer. Uh, she has lots to say about books. And uh, what I was saying in the last session is, um, she has helped me keep my voice like around uh, really problematic authors. Uh, so folks uh, may or may not know, but uh, Sherman Alexi, the author of The Diary of a Part-Time Indian, uh, has become a very problematic uh, person. And there are three people, um, uh, women that have come forward and um, um, and have have shared about this awful um, experience and they um, like within one article, so this is 2015. So like from one article, it was three authors, um, indigenous uh, authors. And then the next article, it was like 10 people. And then the next article, there's 20 women coming forward. And so when I uh, reflect on the murdered missing indigenous women and girls report, one of the things is that we have to believe indigenous women and so I believe these women. And as such, what I try to advocate for is in my school district is, um, you know, I say this author is problematic. Um, and just like I, um, uh, like a relationship breakup, I'm inviting folks to break up with these authors um, uh, like this that have come forward um, and indigenous women are saying they're problematic. And there's a couple more authors, um, sorry, I don't know their name. I can't think of their names right now, but, um, and so what I do in our district is to have those conversations because what I'm learning, and I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if I said at the beginning, I'm not a teacher librarian, um, but I work alongside with many teacher librarians. And so um, I wanna say that right away is I'm not a teacher librarian um, and, um, what I what I am learning about books is, and I'm so grateful, is that books are about conversation. Books seem to be just all about conversation, and I just really enjoy them. I love them. Uh, and when we're having this conversation about problematic authors like Sherman Alexi, is I want to have a conversation about that. You know, if uh, Indigenous women are saying he's problematic, then maybe we should break up with this book, and we can find another book. Uh, to take its place. So I invite folks uh, to um, to that conversation. Uh, if you search her uh, her blog, she does have an entry. Um, one entry was, so this uh, 
Alexi issue was happening around 2015. So I think she has an older uh, entry at that time. And then the most recent entry, I think the last time I looked was he is listed, but it's around the banning of books down in the United States. So the awful, the awfulness that is happening in some of the states um, is just Sorry, I'm just going to say it's just awful. So um, he is on the list of, of books that are um, being banned in some of the states. I'm just going to move on. Um, I do have an action item before we go. We just have like five minutes here. Um, is uh, the action item on our agenda is to uh, please uh, challenge denialism. Uh, challenge denialism. If you can, if you are feel safe enough and strong enough to um, to have, you know, to say that sentence of Indian residential school totally happened. So I did list um, uh, Dr. Sean Carlton's article here. Um, I did put a QR code and it does work. Yay, it works. So I love QR codes. They're like my my new, like when I work with the teacher library and we have a collection, for example, for uh, the Coast Salish uh, war canoes and canoe journeys. And I've made like a larger collection of resources, but I put a QR code next to it. So uh, the teacher librarian puts the, um, the display out of books. And then in the middle is the, um, the page with the QR code. So this is, um, I'm finding, I'm having way too much fun with QR codes. Um, to challenge denialism, I just wanna uh, kind of leave off um, with that stories are medicine. Uh, again, quoting Dr. Nicola Campbell, her research maintains that the continual retelling of stories of despair perpetuates negative stereotypes about indigenous people. This dissertation makes the argument that stories are medicine, and it is time to focus more on sharing stories about the endurance, strength, and achievements of Indigenous people and communities. And I quote um, an amazing Black scholar. I quite love this quote, so I'll, I'll go into it a little bit as our last thought. But the quote is, the abyss may have no bottom, but indigenousness has no top, no limit. Um, and these are three generations of um, my daughter, myself, and my granddaughter as canoe pullers. Um, this is the larger quote, uh, as praxis, colored people's time is imbued with mighty agency, even if, even if it is born in abysmal abjection. The abyss may have no bottom, but blackness has no top. And this is um, this is the book here, How to Go Mad Without Losing Your Mind, uh, Madness and uh, Black Radical Creativity. Uh, and again, with a QR code uh, for that uh, book title. I quite love this book. This book has been so amazing. He kind of does um, like a case study along the way of uh, Black creativity uh, and uh, really brought home to me uh, how our world, the world that I walk around in is not built for me at all. And I hear that from our community, our community leaders, our CM, CM, and they um, will talk about how um, outside of our longhouses, that that world is not built for us. And it's true. Um, and so this, having read this book, it reminded me um, and reminds me that there, um, the madness that happens uh, for uh, Black people, like that it has information. It gives information. Oh, and it's eight. 8.39. Okay, we're on our last minute together. So um, I just want to say uh, I just want to thank everybody again for um, uh, uh, taking time today. And I hope you have a really wonderful weekend. Um, and I will, I'm just going to check my last slide. There. There's the um, residential school denialism QR code.
Yes, that's my second last line. So I just want to thank everybody. So Yelso uh, Kasai, I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend and I just really appreciate your time. And again, thank you to BCTLA. I love this. Um, I love the, uh, the option to be online as well, uh, to do uh, in person and, and then now on, online. So this is really wonderful. I've really enjoyed our time together. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you.